Hi friends, this is me Payal Datta. Welcome to my channel. Today I am going to help you with the line by line explanation of the poem Haunted Houses by Henry Wordsworth Longfellow. Now before I begin the poem, I want you to look around your house. Do you think your house is haunted? Well, my house is haunted too. So in this poem, Longfellow is going to tell us how every house is a haunted house. Now observe the title carefully. Haunted houses. So the poet has very carefully chosen an alliteration as his title. Now what is an alliteration? An alliteration is a figure of speech in which two words that begin with the same letter lie side by side. So here you see in the title Haunted Houses, both the words begin with the letter H. So the title is an example of an alliteration. Now let us begin the poem. All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Here you must remember that in this poem, Longfellow has used the haunted houses as a metaphor. These houses are a metaphor for the memories of the people. The memories of the people who lived in the past. The speaker says that men and women lived and died in these houses and so these houses were haunted. Haunted by the memories of the people who dwelt in these houses. Now through the open doors the harmless phantoms on their errands glide. So here the speaker is saying that these harmless phantoms Phantoms were omnipresent. They glided through the open doors. Now what do you understand by phantoms? Phantoms are nothing but ghosts. They are spirits. They are apparitions. So you see, because these phantoms are nothing but memories of the people of the past, the speaker says that they were harmless. Now, these phantoms were on the errand glide. Now, errand is a short purposeful journey that is made on behalf of someone else. So, here the memories, the histories of the people who lived and died in the house, they made their visit to the house on behalf of those who died. Of the people who died in the past. So the memories are making a short journey on behalf of the dead people. That is the errand. And how did they enter the house? Through the open doors they glided. They floated inside the house. With feet that made no sound upon the floors. So you see these Memories, they are so peaceful. They are soundless. They glide and move inside the house without making any noise. They do not disturb the physical world, but they silently merge with the living world, the real world, the physical world in which you and I are living. Now, the speaker goes on to emphasize that these memories of the past, they haunt the house everywhere. These memories can be found in every corner of the house. And so what does the speaker say? He says, we meet them at the doorway, on the stair, along the passages, they come and go. So these memories, they are omnipresent. From the entrance of the house to the passages, they glide harmlessly. They glide silently in the house. So not only are they harmless, but also impalpable impressions on the air. 
Now, impalpable means intangible. And impressions refer to feelings, emotions. So, these memories, they are intangible feelings. They cannot be touched. And as I said before, they glide in the house. So, they are present on the air. You know, somewhat like an illusion. However, the speaker says that he feels a sense of something moving to and fro. So, the speaker of the poem knows the history of the people who died in that house. And so, he can connect with their memories. He says that he can feel the memories that took place in the house because the memories of the past, they moved. And how did they move? They moved to and fro. Here I want you to notice the phrases to and fro, come and go. You see, the two words are of exactly opposite meanings and they are placed side by side. Now, such a figure of speech is called an antithesis. So, the expressions to and fro, come and go, these are examples of antithesis. Now, if you go back to the first stanza of our poem, the very opening lines, you will see there is an antithesis too. Now, I want you to identify that antithesis and write it quickly on the comments below. Okay, now let us move on with the third stanza. What does the speaker say? There are more guests at the table than the hosts invited. So, here is an imagery that is being used where the people of the living world, the real world, the hosts have organized a get-together. So, the speaker says that the invitees, they enjoyed their gossips. The memories of the past were the extra guests. So, they were like more guests that surrounded the guests of the real world. Your more guest refers to the uninvited memories of the people who lived and died in that house. The ghost, the host and or the organizer as you can say of the gathering, he did not call them. But like uninvited guests, they included themselves in this gathering, in this celebration. The illuminated hall, the brightened up hall is thronged. Now thronged means it is crowded. So the hall room was brightly lit and crowded with quiet inoffensive ghosts. So these gliding memories were quiet and inoffensive. They did not trouble the living host and his guests. They comfortably, they merged with the real world, the living world, the physical world. So the speaker in this poem is showing that the memories of the past, they are not terrifying, they are not haunting. Rather, they are peaceful. They are omnipresent. They are as silent as the pictures on the wall. Here the speaker is using a simile. He uses a simile to compare the harmless ghosts like memories to the silent pictures on the wall. So just like the pictures that are silent on the walls, these memories too make no sound on the floor. They float, they glide. Another thing you must remember is that pictures are associated with memories of the past. So these phantoms and inoffensive ghosts, they too imbibe memories in them. Memories of the past. So the speaker has rightly chosen the comparison to equate the silent memories of the past 
to the silent pictures on the wall. Now we come across a stranger. This stranger could have been a guest in the hall. So the speaker says that the stranger at my fireplace cannot see the forms I see. So you see these forms or these entities, these spirits, these phantoms, these memories. The person who doesn't know them, they cannot see them. The stranger could not see the memories. Perhaps he had no knowledge about the past events that took place in that particular house. Now note that the speaker met this stranger near the fireplace. So here the speaker shows that despite the presence of light, everything cannot be perceived. Everything cannot be seen. This stranger could neither see the forms nor hear the sounds I hear. So the speaker, he could hear the sounds as well as see the forms of memories that roamed in the house. Probably because he knew the past. However, this stranger was sitting by the fireplace he was completely unaware of the past events. And so, he but perceives what is. That is, he could see what was in front of him, what was physically present in front of him. He could only see the tangible world, the real world. But on the other hand, on the contrary, the speaker could peep into the spiritual world. While unto me, all that has been, that is all the past events that have taken place in that house, are visible and clear. So it is all about the perception of the stranger and the perception of the speaker. Not everyone can perceive the spiritual world. However, the speaker says that the spiritual world, it is always present along with the real world. It is omnipresent, yet it is unknown to some. These memories are mysterious. They are like illusions. They are like ghosts. The world of illusion and the world of reality, you see, they are coinciding with each other. With the living host present in the dining party that he has hosted, you have the spirits joining them. But the host does not realize it. So now tell me, do you think your house is haunted too? As we read the fifth stanza, we will find that the theme of inversion of values is projected. Now, we all know that when a person dies, the next generation gets the right to property. But look what the speaker has to say. We have no title deeds to house or lands. Yeah, there is a contradiction to what happens in reality. Title deeds refer to the legal documents in which one person identifies himself as the owner of the property. So, there are documents of ownership. The speaker says that the people of the real world do not have such legal rights on the houses and lands where the people of the past have lived and died. Why is it so? Because owners and occupants of earlier dates. Here the speaker is referring to the people who lived and died in that house. Who occupied the house and lands in the past. They, from graves forgotten, stretch their dusty hands. As if they want to hold on to something. So, what do these dead people want to hold on to? And hold in what main still their old estate. So, they want to hold on to their old property. They are unwilling to give up their ownership. 
Now, mot mean here refers to that properties cannot be transferred. It is a French term, okay? And it was used usually in churches to imply that the property of the church belonged to the church. Its ownership was non-transferable. So, here the speaker wants to say that the people who lived and died in these haunted houses did not want to transfer their ownership to the next generation, to the present generation. They wanted to retain their ownership and remain the owners and occupants of the house. Now quickly tell me in the comment section what figure of speech is found in the phrase owners and occupants. Well, so long we saw that the spirit world is omnipresent. It merges with the real world. So in the sixth stanza, the speaker further emphasizes on the coexistence of these two worlds. What does he say? The spirit world around this world of sense floats like an atmosphere. So, this world of sense refers to the real physical world. So, the spirit world of memories, it floats like an atmosphere around the real world. Here, the speaker uses a simile to compare the spiritual world to an atmosphere. So, just like an atmosphere, the memories of the past, they envelop the real world. They surround the real world and everywhere wafts through these earthly mists. Wafts means it, they float, they glide. So these spirits, they float in earthly mists. They are illusionary. Yet, see, they are merging with something earthly, the earthly mists. Mists are like fog. And vapor dents a vital breath. So, these memories, they vapor dense, meaning they exhale. They exhale, they emit a white, that is a very important breath. And the breath of these spiritual memories are of more ethereal air. That is, these breath, these spiritual breath, they are heavenly. They are ethereal. Ethereal means something very heavenly. Now that the two worlds coexist, the speaker goes on to say how the living world balances their materialistic wants and spiritual desires. What does he say? He says, our little lives are kept in equipoise. Equipoise means in a balance, in equilibrium. And little lives, see this again is an alliteration. So, our little lives, they are kept in balance by opposite attractions and desires. We all have materialistic wants and spiritual desires. So the speaker here says that these earthly demands of us and spiritual goals and aims, they are kept in balance in our little lives. Now, why does he say little lives? Why are our lives little? Little because we all are mortals. Remember what Brutus said in Julius Caesar? He told Cassius that men are aware that they will die, but they want to live longer. They want to prolong their death. So in this poem, the speaker wants to say that we all will die one day. And therefore our lives are little. It is limited. Then he goes on to show the struggle or the conflict that living people, that the real life people, they face. The struggle, the conflict of the instinct that enjoys, that is the materialistic wants to secure some sort of pleasure. It is for pleasure purpose, the materialistic wants. 
and the more noble instinct that aspires that is we also have some spiritual aims in life some noble instinct some spiritual goals so there is a war there is a conflict between these two instincts now what do you understand by instincts instincts means uh something that is inborn in you it is a natural behavior it comes from within this conflict between the two instincts that is the material wants and the spiritual goals these two conflict between each other so the conflict between these two instincts keeps the little lives in balance in equipoise so you see how beautifully struggle is creating a balance in the lives of the real people then the poet goes on to say the speaker these perturbations that is these disruptions these struggles these conflicts between the two instincts this perpetual jar of earthly wants and aspirations hi now perpetual means never ending so these never ending jar of materialistic demands and aspiration that is goals and high spiritual aims they come from the influence of an unseen star so there is an unseen star that acts like an influence it is an undiscovered planet in our skies so this unseen star and undiscovered planet they influence us it acts as a guide that encourages us to grow to balance our instincts so here you can say that the star and this planet this undiscovered planet and these uns unseen star they both are metaphors a metaphor for what they are compared to someone who guide us so they are been compared to a facilitator in our lives who balance our instincts so then what does the poet say and as the moon from some dark gate of cloud throws over the sea a floating bridge of light so the moon throws its light over the sea from the dark cloud the floating bridge it is a metaphor the beams of light that are coming from the moon and falling on the sea that is being compared to a floating bridge the moonlight see it acts like a bridge that connects the cloud to the sea now earlier if you remember we were told that the spiritual world envelops the real world like an atmosphere so here again we see that the cloud which is a part of an atmosphere that is the spiritual world the spiritual world is being connected to the real world by the moonlight then the moonlight it merges the two worlds the spiritual and the materialistic it bridges the gap between the two worlds here it is a floating bridge so even this bridge you see it is illusionary it is not real it is like an illusion so there is a mystery behind it across whose trembling planks so the planks that is the wooden flooring of the bridge it trembles it shakes now why does this bridge shake it shakes because our fancies crowd into the realm of mystery and night the speaker says that the fancies our desires they they all gather into the realm realm means the world the land or the region so our collected desires of materialistic pleasures they enter the spiritual world of mystery
a mystic land a mystic region a mystic realm so as our wishes fantasies and our desires they move from the material world to the spiritual world on this floating bridge what happens the bridge shakes the bridge trembles so from the world of spirits there descends a bridge of light so from the spiritual world a ray of light descends that is it falls it comes down to the real world this ray of light or the beam of light coming from the moon connects it with this it connects the spiritual world with this real world over whose unsteady floor that is the trembling planks of the bridge that sways and bends so there is a conflict between the instincts that makes the bridge unstable it sways it bends it shakes it swings on this oscillating bridge what happens wander our thoughts our thoughts they walk they stroll above the dark abyss now abyss means a deep bottomless surface you cannot see the bottom now you know that it was night time that is why you have the moon and therefore it was dark the bottom of the sea that is unknown a floating bridge of light it falls on this bottomless sea while our instincts they struggle on the beams of the moonlight to merge to equipoise to balance our material desires with our spiritual aims So with this we come to an end of our today's lesson. So this poem you see it revolves around the conflict of duality that is there in every human being. It projects the constant struggle that we face between materialism and spirituality. You can also say that this poem it shows that the past it has an impact on our present and also the future to come and every house is haunted i hope i could clear all your doubts from this poem but even then if you have any doubt feel free to ask me in the comments below i will definitely respond so see you in my next video till then tada